All right. Excellent. Very good. Yes, and I'm even remembering to record, Sharon. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to session two of the Treason of Isengard. Uh, so tonight we're going to be discussing uh, the next two, so chapters three and four of the Treason of Isengard, which you will notice contains <laughs> it's a, uh, a certain amount of poetry, uh, which means it's going to be a fair bit of challenge for me to get through class tonight. So I have... Um, uh, uh, I have strategized this by saving most of the poetry till the end, or at least near the end of the class. Uh, so I'm definitely uh, hoping to, you know, be uh, uh, to, to see if we can get at least some of the way here uh, through this stuff. So, uh, without further ado, let's uh, let's keep going. All right. Um, uh, <laughs> people are teasing me for the number of uh, channels on which I'm broadcasting now, which is now three currently simultaneously. Uh, but no, I'm not going to do Snapchat live. Uh, I actually don't Snapchat, James. I'm not quite cool enough for that. I'm kind of cool, but I'm not cool enough for that, I think. Um, uh uh, yeah, oh, Karita, yeah, this is, I am wearing an earpiece today. I'm wearing this, this is an experiment, and actually, if you are watching on Facebook Live, you can tell me, uh, I know last week there was weird modulations in the volume, I have no idea why that happened. I can only imagine it must be, uh, like, my phone trying helpfully to adjust the volume automatically or something like that. So I am experimenting. Uh, this week uh, with doing the audio through my earpiece. So I'm hoping that that might make a difference. We'll see. Just an experiment. Um, and the rest of you guys can get used to seeing me wearing an earpiece. Actually, truth to tell, this is how I look most of the time. I actually go around the house with an earpiece on a lot because this is I listen to audiobooks th through my Bluetooth uh, so I don't have to have wires. So uh, I, that means I'll, like when I'm doing housework and stuff, I'm always doing housework with a with a with with, with a Bluetooth on and stuff. So uh, it uh, it happens. So oh hey Jacob, good to see you. I haven't seen you in forever. Um, okay, all right, let's. Let's see. Oh, oh, yeah. Yana and Jacob are both commenting on the beard. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've, I've been I've been liking it. I'm 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 growing attached to the beard. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, likely to um, likely to be a feature, actually. So, uh, yeah. OK. All right. Um, let's. Uh, Let's let, let's 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 get rolling because I'm not I have a lot of slides tonight, <laughs> so we'll we'll see how this goes uh, tonight. Okay, so now we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the ring race. We're going to talk about the narrator. We're going to talk about wizards, both Gandalf and Saruman, who of course makes his big first appearance uh, in tonight's reading, and poems. Uh, so that's going to be great, and there will be singing. Um, so, uh, okay, yeah, Takako, no, I'm not broadcasting on Twitter. I'm doing uh, the Mythgard Academy uh, sessions on Facebook Live, and I'm doing Exploring the Lord of the Rings on Twitter, so we're kind of mixing it up there a little bit. Um, okay, all right. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the, the ring wraiths first. Um, when we were doing, in Exploring the Lord of the Rings, when we were doing Chapter 4, uh, Shortcut to Mushrooms, we uh, spent some time uh, in that session talking about, this is of course in a totally different thread, um, but in that class we spent some time talking about particularly the elocution of the Nazgul. Um, uh, how the Nazgul's, uh, how the Nazgul's, listen to me, how the Nazgul's talk. And uh, I want to look at how they're talking here, because remember, Let's not take this for granted, right? Let's recall for a second our return of the shadow. The ringwraiths have been a, a developing thing. It was not that long ago in the, you know, in the in the world of these of these draft developments. It was not that long ago uh, that the ringwraiths were still barrel whites, right? You know, where he was really not sure what the uh, what they were. Um, he certainly, um, uh, <laughs> he certainly um, was. Uh, interested in um, developing the ring wraiths right from the very beginning, they were connected with the ring, and you know the idea that they were, uh, you know, people who had been corrupted by the ring and stuff was was the the origin of the concept after the Black Rider appeared and he had to figure out what the heck it was. But after that, um, you know, there was um, uh, there. 
he was as we've seen him be pretty uncertain, uh, and he's abandoned. He clearly abandoned the ring wraith, the uh, ring wraith as Barrow White idea, the identity between those two things. Um, after phase two and the phase three manuscript, that seems to be gone. But there's still a lot of uncertainty. I mean, it's it's you know uh, about who and who and what they are. So uh, let's um, uh, let's keep. Let's look at so I, I th- there's there's a bunch of passages that I want to look at which I think give us some interesting evidence help us to kind of build a picture of what exactly uh, is going on here right of what exactly the um, uh, the 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 ring rates are and how they are and what their status is and how they act and all that kind of thing so those this is the first collection of passages uh, I want to I want to look at for this um, okay. We want. This is, by the way, uh, the the ringwraiths speaking to um, uh, the ringwraith speaking to uh, uh, Harry Goatleaf at the gate of Bree. We want news. Hissed a cold voice through the keyhole. What of? He answered, shaking in his boots. News of hobbits riding on ponies out of the Shire. Have they passed? Harry wished they had, for it might have satisfied these riders if he could have said yes. There was a threat in the cold voice, but he dared not risk a yes that was not true. No, sir, he said in a quavering voice. There's been no shire hobbits on ponies through Bree, and there isn't likely to be any. A hiss came through the keyhole, and Harry started back, feeling as if something icy cold had touched him. Yes, it is likely, said the voice fiercely. Three, perhaps four. You will watch. We want Baggins. He is with them. You will watch. You will let you will tell us and not lie. We shall come back. Okay. Um, so what do you notice here? One thing is that uh, uh, you know one thing that I would that sort of strikes me right away um, is the once again we can see the clipped phrasing and short sentences right. Um, that is very distinctive, especially in that last paragraph when he gets going and has a long speech, right? Um, his shorter speech is, news of hobbits riding on ponies out of the Shire. Now, notice that's not a properly, like, subordinated clause or something, exactly, um, but, um, but nevertheless, it's, um, it's, yeah. So, uh, Mary, do you think their common speech has improved here from the book, or in the published book it's better? Uh, than it is here. Notice, again, that business at the end, right? Three, perhaps four. You will watch. We want Baggins. He is with them. You will watch. You will tell us and not lie. Hey, look, look, a compound verb. We shall come back, right? That string of, uh, um, that string of very simple sentences, right? Um, is, uh, uh, is, 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 seems to be fairly indicative. We see that same, we can see that same pattern. Um, you can see it when he's talking to Farmer Maggot. It's not quite as persistent as this, uh, but, um, but it's definitely, uh, it, it's, it's definitely there. Uh, Mary, you think it's, uh, that their, their, their speech is better here than in the published text? Possibly, in some places, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Kate likes the sibilance uh, in the first sentence. News of hobbits riding on ponies out of the Shire. Have they passed? Yes. Uh, you don't even have... Uh, it's. It, we're told that the voice is hissing, uh, Kate, and of course, we. you know, his, his sentence hisses all by itself, right? That's, uh, that's, that's very good. Um, and yes, Carita, uh, it's not just that they're using simple sentences. They're using simple sentences with a lot of imperatives, right? You will watch. We want Baggins. You will watch. You will tell us and not lie, right? Um, even that last bit, you will tell us and not lie, right, suggests somebody who is not real familiar with the language, right? Um, that same sentiment might be expressed by a native speaker, but probably not like that. You will tell us and not lie, right? Um, uh yeah, Stephanie, it does sound like somebody who's fairly poorly... Uh, that that element does sound like somebody who's, uh, whose language is not totally fluent here. Um, 
Jonathan, they do sound like a bunch of thugs. Uh, uh, you know, if you, uh, I guess, Jonathan, if we did them in like a Brooklyn accent, it might work, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, Jez, you're right. Uh, and thanks for staying up with me, Jez. I, I, I see that you caught me uh, uh, live late at night over there. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they, they do seem to be into statements of fact, right? Statements of fact and simple commands. That's what they do, at least especially there at the end. Again, a little more complicated earlier on, right? They manage a question. Have they passed, right? Um, we want news. Um, but uh, yeah, simple statements of fact and basic questions. Um, <laughs> Arthur thinks they it's sort of like B-movie Nazis. Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'm going to be able to manage the Brooklyn accent, Karina. Karina is double dog daring me to do the the Brooklyn accent, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can manage that. Um, Nicole is wondering if the broken speech patterns could be the last thread of humanity uh, that they hold on to. Um, I, it's possible. It's possible. I, I mean, it, it 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 does make you wonder, right? Is this somebody whose language ability is not excellent? Or is this somebody who just doesn't know this language, right? It could be either one. Uh, and it's interesting, Nicole, to think about the possibility um, of this being basically a, a, a somebody whose very thought, whose very relationship with language is essentially fragmented, right? Um, and uh, you know that that does seem to me possible. We don't really know any reason uh, uh, otherwise. <laughs> Jez says that's a nice gate. Be a shame if someone has gold it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, Tony says uh, one wonders just how often they actually speak to others over the millennia. Exactly, Tony. Right? Just, just, just do they not converse? Um, are, is, is it yeah? Is, is it that they barely really know how to relate to others that way? Um, you know, I wonder. I'm not really sure. Um, right. Exactly. Patricia, these are the last remnants of uh, the language that has faded in the wraithification process. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, w James Oakley is thinking that this uh, invokes the question, do the Nazgul have memories of their mortal lives? Well, goodness. No idea, right? Uh, no way of knowing. In fact, um, remember that it's not even obvious that they had mortal lives to start with, right? Um, remember at the very beginning, these were, uh, there were elf wraiths as well, and the, they were, they you know, they weren't numbered. I think we're, we're pretty clearly now mortal at this point, but at the beginning, again, in the, in the initial conception, uh, that wasn't even there. Um, so again, we have to try to be careful. It's one of the things that I, uh, that I think is really interesting, but often really challenging, uh, with reading the text at this stage, right? Is to, rec to, to, constantly um, remind ourselves that uh, we don't have the published text, right? So not to sort of reach forward to the stuff that we know and kind of project that backwards. It's possible that Tolkien was already thinking many of the things that we see in the published text, but we can't be sure of that yet. So we have to be careful uh, to think that through a little bit. Um, the full story of the Ringwraiths and who they are and what their background is. Again, remember, it was not too long ago that they were Barrow Whites, um, which is also kind of interesting too, right? Um, Michael, I don't think that Ringwraiths do much casual conversing either. Um, uh, definitely. Um, that's interesting, Brandon. Brandon suggests that perhaps the uh, uh, the the language that the Nazgul remember has changed so much that uh, you know it's it's now completely different and they can't really speak it anymore. Um, that certainly seems uh, seems possible. Um, yeah, yeah. No, th there are there are nine uh, wraiths at this point, James. Already, um, that's been decided. Uh, but um, but yeah, again, the the the, the background of the wraiths, who they were and what the, um, what the point, you know, was, uh, you know, of them, uh, is less, uh, is less clear. 
Um, yeah, yeah, Margaret, I do suspect that uh, there's a lot of imperative mood used in uh, the language of Mordor. That seems that seems quite likely. Um, oh, that's an interesting question, James. James Stevens asks if uh, they've lost their individuality, seeing as they they, they they just keep saying we, right? They're not, you know, they don't say I. Um, I don't think it proves it, right? I think it... Um, uh, you know, I don't think that we necessarily have to, um, you know, hear this as like a, a Borg we here. Uh, I mean, there is more than one of them there, right? And the one who's speaking is the spokesperson, not only for the, the, the what is it, two of them that are coming to the gate here tonight? We'll review that in a little bit. That'll be fun. Um, but, um, but is also, you know, speaking on behalf of all the rest of them. So it's possible that they just mean that, but it is, it is definitely possible uh, that they don't really think of themselves as individuals in the same way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good. Uh, let's see. All right. <laughs> Karita says, my earpiece already had her thinking about the Borg. It's not quite that bad. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. Let's, get, let's look at our next little Nazgulish bit here. This is their conversation with Butterbur in this version. Baggins, said I. This is, of course, Butterbur telling the story. If you were looking for hobbits of that name, you'd best look in the Shire. There are none in Bree. The last time one of that name came here was nigh on a score of years back. Mr. Bilbo Baggins he was, as disappeared out of Hobbiton. He went off east long enough ago. At that name, he drew in his breath and sat up. Then he stooped at me again. But there is also Frodo Baggins, said he, in a whisper like a knife. Is he here? Has he been? Do not lie to us. I was all of a Twitter, I can tell you, but I was angry as well. No is the answer, said I, and you'll get no lies here, so you'd best be civil. If you have any message for any party, you may leave it, and I'll look out for them. The message is wait, said he. We may return. And with that, the three of them turned their horses and rode off into the fog. Now, Mr. Green, what do you say to that? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, oh, so, pardon, let me explain here. Uh, so, Stephen on Facebook is asking, are there other places? Oh, yeah. I'm simulcasting this on three places at once. The other comments that I'm referring to that you're not seeing uh, are mostly from within the GoToWebinar session uh, that I am running uh, and which has a, a large number of people in it. Uh, that is the primary place. I am seeing the comments on Facebook and trying to, to, uh, uh, to talk to them, uh, to uh, reach those as well. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, is the sound still going up and down? Oh, well. See, Karita, my Borg solution didn't work. Um, that's why I'm wearing my earpiece today, to try to do the audio through that and hope that that would make a difference. This happened last week, too. Uh, if any of you have any theory as to why my audio is modulating, it's weird. It's just going through my phone. I have no idea why it would be modulating like that. Um, but anyway, whatever. I'll try to figure that out. Um, but you can, there, there are two other places. You can go to Mythgard.org and the Treason of Isengard page under the Mythgard Academy tab. There's a link there to register for the webinar and you can enter the webinar and join with us. Or you can go to twitch.tv uh, and uh, twitch.tv slash signumu and uh, go to our, Signum, our, our Twitch channel, uh, uh, our Signum Twitch channel, and we're broadcasting there. So... Uh, let me know. Again, those of you on Facebook, please do let me know if the audio is, if, especially if you were here last week, if the audio is better than last week. Uh, and we'll see, uh, we'll see what you think about that. I can't figure out the audio thing. Whatever. I'm trying. Anyhow. Um, so um, let's, um, let's look back at our, at our ring rates here. Um, Nadia, absolutely. Um, the use of the use of uh, of Frodo's name is the real shocker here, right? Of the entire passage, that's the big shocker that the Nazgul know somehow. How do the Ringwraiths know Frodo's name? That's pretty intense, right? Um, this this theorizes this passage theorizes a very well informed set of Ringwraiths, and that in turn 
to me, really kind of qualifies my reading of the earlier passage, right? Because they've got to know the language reasonably well. They've clearly heard the story, right? When he says, oh, yeah, Baggins has been through here, but we haven't seen him in 20 years, um, they're not confused, right? They're all like, oh, yes, no, that's Bilbo Baggins. We understand that. But no, we're looking for Frodo Baggins. Um, how do they know Frodo Baggins exists? How do they know any Baggins' first name? Right? How do they know that Frodo exists? How do they know that it's Frodo that they're looking for and not Bilbo? Right? Um, those are all things that um, he seems to be implying. You know that, that you know, things that are that are all kind of built in uh, to this uh, uh, to this fact that they're asking after Frodo. Um, it seems that they they must have gotten more information from somebody, right? Hobbits, probably. Uh, if they were only armed with Baggins, they might have gotten the story out of uh, somebody chatty, right? Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the gaffer somehow, uh, uh, somehow explained it, right? Um, about Mr. Frodo and Mr. Bilbo, right? How would they know that they're looking for Frodo and not for Bilbo? That's a little less certain. I don't know that exactly. How would they know that Bilbo didn't have the ring anymore? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and yes, I am following the Twitch chat as well. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, so um, anyway, good. So... He seems, Tolkien seems to ditch this idea, right? So, and it, you know, it's always hard, it's always hard to guess not only, um, not only what is sort of behind the drafts that he's putting in here, but why it is that he cuts it exactly, right? You know, we can kind of speculate, Christopher sometimes speculates, uh, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's, It's real. It's t to me the ditching of the highly informed ring wraiths uh, is not a huge surprise, but it is interesting again that that was ever even on the table, right? Um, not just that they found a source to tell them this information, but clearly they were able to converse and get this out of you know people, um, and uh, uh, it suggests a, a, a sort of a more significant level of. Um, uh, of conversational ability, right? Individual intelligence, maybe. Um, and that's, that's good to know. It's interesting to see. Um, <laughs> Emily asks, uh, do the Nazgul actually expect Frodo to wait if Butterbird tells them to? Uh, uh, it seems the least likely thing to happen considering how scary the riders are. Yeah, Emily, it's hard to imagine that even the Nazgul think He's going to take them up on that, right? Tell them to wait. We'll be right back. But uh, if you remember, if you did the Return of the Shadow with us, you may remember in the third phase text, they do a similar thing. They, they do leave a message with Butterbur uh, for Frodo. And it's, it's basically, um, a, you know, a scary message seems to be designed to intimidate him. Um, and that, that's how I take that wait. You know, like, wait, wait here. We're coming for you. Right. Um, and not that the, he's really likely to wait, uh, but uh, but it certainly is designed to 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 terrify. I think that's that's clearly that's clearly the point. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Mead is suggesting that maybe uh, these uh, the, the, these ring rates connected with the Sackville Bagginses who were happy to to dish everything they could. Uh, yeah, maybe. Lotho and Lobelia would totally give them up, Tony. I have to agree with that. Um, yeah, and but Yana, I agree. There is something much creepier uh, and scarier about them being sort of better informed and more competent, right? I mean, that is... Uh, uh, I can see why Tolkien went that direction, right? Because um, that's, that's, that's it's much scarier than showing the ring wraiths to be just kind of beating around in the dark. Um yeah, but but Karita, I'm glad that you pointed this out as well. Um, Butterbur also is taking no guff off the ring wraiths, and that's a trend, right? Um, 
this is still true, at least in Butterbur's own account of it, this is still true in the published text. It's true of Farmer Maggot, and it's true of uh, Gaffer Gamgee, right? Um, they, uh, they all three of them, uh, you know, give some lip to the, to the ringwraiths when they're confronted with them. So what this shows is, what that shows by itself, there is no, like, overwhelming intimidation factor on the part of the ringwraiths here. They don't... You know, Harry is very scared of them, right? They clearly do have an impact on people. But it's not... It's not overwhelming. It's not something that you can't overcome. Um, all of the sort of stalwart guy, you know, good guys, you know, and these are all like salt of the earth kind of guys, right? Uh, Butterbur and Farmer Maggot and Gaffer Gamgee. You know, they all, man, you know, none of them are just uh, cowed into uh, into terror. Even though, even though, Butterbur does confess himself to be uh, uh, to be all, uh, all of a Twitter. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, Mary, it does not seem that the concept of the Black Breath has emerged. That seems fairly safe to me. Um, there's no indication that that kind of proximity to them uh, seems to have that effect quite yet. Um, the effect that it has on Mary, I mean, that's... Um, Mary is overcome later on in Brie, so we do still get that, but uh, it's certainly not... Again, it's not an unavoidable effect, clearly. Um, Josiah points out the chill that Harry felt. Yeah, I... I I don't know, Josiah, if that's a literal chill or if it's just sort of indicative of his own fear, right? Um, you know, a way to, to sort of convey to us the, you know, the, the fear reaction that he's having. But, uh, uh, but possibly, possibly. Um, it could be both, Brianna. It absolutely could be both. Uh, can't rule that out. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. The, especially in conjunction with Frodo's dream from last time, uh, I was really interested by what the um, what the Nazgul do here. This is the second time or third. This is what you know. The, of course, one of the many versions of the attack on Crick Hollow. There came the soft fall of hoofs. Horses were drawing near, led slow and cautiously. The gate in the hedge opened, and up the path filed three shapes hooded, swathed in black, and stooping low towards the ground. One went to the door, one to each corner of the house end on either side, and there they stood, silent as the black shadows of stones, while time went slowly on, and the house and the trees about it seemed to be waiting breathlessly. There was a faint stir in the leaves, and a cock crowed. The cold hour before dawn had come. Suddenly the figure by the door moved. In the dark, without star or moon, a blade that was drawn gleamed, as if a chill light had been unsheathed. There was a blow, soft but heavy, and the door shuddered. "'Open in the name of Sauron,' said a voice, cold and menacing. At a second blow the door yielded, and fell back, its lock broken, and timbers burst. The black figures passed swiftly in. At that moment, nearby among the trees, a horn rang out. It rent the night like a fire on a hilltop, echoing over the land." Awake! Fear! Fire! Foes! Awake! Someone was blowing the horn call of Buckland, which had not been sounded for a hundred years, not since the white wolves came in the fell winter when the brandy wine was frozen. Far away, answering horns were, were heard. Distant sounds of waking and alarm came through the night. The whole of Buckland was aroused. Um, this, of course, is the version of the story in which Gandalf arrives just before they do, and he and Ham sneak out the back door together, and it's Gandalf blowing the horn. It's always Gandalf blowing the horn. Um, I think that happens in every single version of this story. No, not the one where Gandalf arrives too late. Then I think it's Ham blowing the horn. Um, but, um, uh, anyway, so, um, the, um, so it's Gandalf blowing the horn, and, and right after this, you know, Gandalf and uh, with Ham on his horse come come uh, riding after them uh, and uh, chase them. Uh, it, it's, you know, then so Gandalf chases the ring wraiths away. Um, what do you notice? 
What strikes you about the, the Black Riders here? Yes, Arthur, good. They use the name of Sauron, right? Um, yes, open in the name of Mordor is what they say uh, in the books. And, uh, and yes, Arthur, as you, as you recall correctly, in uh, uh, Aragorn is the one who says that uh, Sauron doesn't allow his name to be spelt or spoken. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Jez, I agree. This is a re- the, the, the uh, sinister and creepy and then plunging into uplifting action. Yeah, and I love the horn call of Buckland. Always been one of my favorites. Um, Jez, I was really tempted. It was hard to stop the passage here because, of course, right after that is the passage with Gandalf galloping down and the sheaf of lightning and all that stuff. Uh, but um, we already looked at that before and didn't want to overindulge. Um, Lynn points out that the door shutters as if even the house is, uh, is, is afraid. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, okay. Yeah, Brian, you are asking exactly the question that I was asking when reading this passage. Why do they approach so cautiously? Why do they wait? Um, and notice they wait for a long time. So the Black Riders come up to the house, right? And the th- there are three of them. And they stand in the front, one near the door, and the two on either corner, either corner of the front of the house, leaving the back door unwatched so that Hammond and Gandalf can sneak out. Um, and then they do nothing. There they stood, silent as the black shadows of stones, while time went slowly on, and the house and the trees about it seemed to be waiting breathlessly. There was a faint stir in the leaves, and a cock crowed. The cold hour before dawn had come. Right? So it's what hours that they're standing there. Now, don't get me wrong, this is really creepy, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it has a really, um, uh, it has a really profound effect, I think. Uh, I, I mean, it certainly builds the tension and the, the, the idea of the Black Riders just standing there outside the house, right? Silent, motionless, watching uh, as hours and hours go by. Um, is freaky, and it's I mean it, it has a really cool, but it's also a little strange, right? Why do they do this? Um, and again, as I said, especially in conjunction with Frodo's dream uh, that we were looking at last time, it seems interesting because, of course, that's exactly what we see the Ringwraiths doing there, standing around outside the wall surrounding the tower where Gandalf has taken refuge and just besieging him, right? Just standing there, sitting there on their horses, watching, not moving, just watching, constantly watching. That's what Frodo sees in his dream. Um, so, uh, yeah, they are strategic and patient, Kimber says. Yeah, um, very patient. Um, I'm not sure why they're waiting exactly. I don't know what they're waiting for precisely. I don't know if, I mean, if there's something in particular they have to gain, if they're looking, I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, um, other than kind of being, uh, being, being freaky. Um, they're, they're being cautious, Brian, possibly. Yeah. Um, which is interesting in itself, right? Suggesting that they themselves are concerned, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Tony says he thinks the answer is because they're creepy. Uh, yeah, possibly, possibly. Um, Stephen asks if they're waiting for a specific hour. Stephen, that's what it sounds like, right? The cold hour before dawn had come. He doesn't just say, like, it was the cold hour before dawn. Like, this was the point at which this next point of action happened. But uh, the had come makes it sound like they were waiting for that. Like, that was... At the cold hour before dawn, now they act. Is it because they're strongest in the... Exactly, Jez is remembering, you know, the darkest hour is just before dawn, right? Is their power greatest at that moment? Is this strategic in that... Or, like, not just strategic, tactical, in fact, right? Um, Are they worried that they're going to have to face Gandalf? um, And they want to be at their strongest when they do it? That's possible, right? Well, they're not going anywhere, except they are. Um, so let's wait until... Uh, uh, yeah, Josiah says their hour had not yet come. It does sound like that kind of language. Um, 
Stephen, I see you found Twitch there. Are they waiting for more of them to arrive? Um, it, I don't think so. Uh, not based on the movement chart that we'll get later on. Not chart, but the, the movement summary that we'll get later on. I think they're on their own and they know it, which again would make sense if they were actually stronger in the dark hour before the dawn. Um, are they waiting for the moon to set? Hmm. It mentions the moon, doesn't it? Where's the moon? Uh, the gate opened. Uh, didn't it mention... Isn't the moon somewhere? Maybe I'm making that up. No? Oh, yeah, there it is. In the dark without star or moon. Yeah, there we go. It doesn't prove, of course, that the moon had been up previously, but, of course, it's very possible, right, that they were waiting for moon set. Um, so, yes, yes, possibly. Um, good, good. <laughs> Stephen suggests they maybe they get a plus one attack bonus for each full turn they spend focusing. It is possible that they were just uh, 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 buffing uh, at that point, and they were waiting until they were fully, uh, uh, full, you know, had all of their buffs in place and were ready to go. Um, but basically, that's sort of another way of saying what we were just saying, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep going. This is the next version when they, in fact, catch uh, Ham. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the black figures passed swiftly in. In a moment they came out again. One was carrying a small bundled figure in an old cloak. It did not struggle. Now they leaped upon their horses without caution. In the lane the noise of hoofs broke out, and gathering to a gallop went hammering away into the darkness. At the same moment, struck out from the direction of the ferry, another horse came thundering along the lane. As it passed the gate, a horn rang out. It rent the night like a f like fire on a hilltop. And we get the same stuff. Fear, fire, foes awake. Far away, answering horns were heard. The alarm was spreading. Buckland was aroused. But the black riders rode like a gale to the north gate. Let the little people blow. Sauron would deal with them later. In the meanwhile, they had earned his thanks. Baggins was caught like a fox in a hole. They rode down the watchman, leaped the gate, and vanished. And that is how Hamilcar Bolger first crossed the Brandywine Bridge. Okay. Um, what strikes you here? This, you know, of course, you know, the story's changing, right? We don't have Gandalf uh, coming in the nick of time. We have Gandalf coming just slightly too late, a couple minutes too late, right? And hot on the heels of the Nazgul as they're riding out uh, with Hamilcar. Um, James, yes. Uh, James Stevens points out that the narrator tells us what the writers are thinking. That's remarkable. Indeed, unique, I think. Have we seen that anywhere? And I mean unique, again, in the manuscript history to this point. Has the narrator ever told us what the writers are thinking before? Told us something from the writer's point of view? I don't think so. I don't think he has. So that's very interesting. Um, and what do we see, right, when we see their thoughts? Um, their confidence, right? Their elation, their being pleased at uh, having done something that's going to earn them praise from their master. They had earned Sauron's thanks. Um, okay, so Yana and Stephen and a couple other people, Tony as well, are asking exactly the same um, question that I'm asking here. I I don't get the geography there either. How is it that this is how Hamilcar Bolger first crossed the Brandywine Bridge? He's already across the bridge. Um, I mean, does he mean like 
this is the story of Hamilcar. Like, like this is what happens to Hamilcar Bolger the first time he crosses the Brandywine Bridge. Like, you know, and so ends the story of Hamilcar Bolger's first trip across the Brandywine Bridge. I mean, like, I guess he could mean that, but that's not what it says. Um, that is how he first crossed the Brandywine Bridge. I mean, it would be a great story if the first time he was ever across the bridge was on the back of a horse, the prisoner of a Nazgul, right? I mean, that would be a, a pretty interesting claim to fame, right? But he's already over there. I don't get it. And they're not going, they're not taking a left, they're taking a right. I mean, they're heading out towards Bree. They're not heading back into the Shire. So and, and it wouldn't be the first time anyway. Um... Unless, I, so I don't, um, Damas says he might have been using Buckleberry Ferry at other times. That's entirely possible. But wh- how is he, why is he crossing the bridge here? I mean, do, are, are, are we saying that the, the Nazgul are going up and, and taking a left and crossing the bridge back into the Shire? Why are they running back into the, surely, they think they have Baggins, obviously, Right? They think they have already captured Baggins. Surely they're going to take him straight to their master, right? Straight to the to the uh, the king of the Nazgul, who is clearly south of Bree, not in the Shire, right? And with Gandalf hot on their heels with a sheaf of lightning, they're going to run towards the king. They're not going to run their king, right? They're not going to run towards uh, run away from him into the Shire. I don't get it. I just this this. Um, this flummoxed me. That line flummoxes me entirely, and I'm, I'm I was kind of relieved to see that you guys were asking the same question that I was, because honestly, I spent probably about ten minutes looking at that sentence, being like, "Okay, hang on, I'm I'm, I'm gonna feel really dumb when I uh, uh, when I when I fig- you know when 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 this makes sudden sense suddenly, but I just couldn't make uh, sense of it at all. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm a little bit. Um, I'm a little bit unclear uh, about this. I think it must be just a mistake. Um, you know, Mary, as you were just suggesting, uh, I, I, I don't, um, I don't see any way to understand it in any other way. Uh, Cause Tony, he had settled this on the map. I, I mean, it is always possible, especially since this is an early stage that maybe he's revising the map, but uh, from the beginning, I mean, the crossing of the river, they just crossed the river on the ferry. Gandalf just came from the ferry. Uh, you know, the ferry is mentioned in this passage. Uh, so they're obviously on the other side of the river from the Shire. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, yeah. Um, Kate is thinking he probably meant crossing the border of the Shire. Yeah. Like this is, this is how he left the Shire. Um, that makes a certain amount of, uh, uh, sense, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think it's just got to be a mistake. Um, but, um, the thing that gets me about this passage is the tone. It's the narrator's tone. As we said at first, we're seeing inside the head of, um, um, we're seeing inside the head of, of, of the Black Riders for the first time. Um, but it's, when we do, they're not being taken seriously. We're being invited to laugh at them here. I mean, this is a, a scary scene, but we're we're being invited to laugh, right? I mean, is that just me? We're being invited to laugh? Forget the last line for a second, right? Um, but the Black Riders rode like a gale to the North Gate. Let the little people blow. Sauron would deal with them later. In the meanwhile, they had earned his thanks. Baggins was caught like a fox in a hole. They rode down the watchman, leaped the gate, and vanished. Victorious! Except, of course, we know they're wrong. Right? The joke's on them. They got the fake Baggins. They, they don't have Baggins. They think they do, but they don't. The, the dramatic irony there, right? The fact that we know as readers more than the Black Riders know puts us in a position to laugh at them. It makes them look silly. Um, Jennifer, exactly. They come off looking like a right bunch of idiots. That's exactly uh, the effect. Um, and especially, no, there's a there's a kind of there's a sharp irony in the you know in the meanwhile they had earned his thanks, 
<laughs> maybe not so much, right? Um, uh, and then the last line. The tone of that last line is unmistakable. That's a joke, right? And that is how Hamilcar Bolger first crossed the Brandywine Bridge. So if we forget about the geography issue, right? Um, what, like, seriously? It's a That's the punchline? There's a punchline to this story? <laughs> like, so we were getting a Hobbit abduction by the Nazgul and we end with a punchline? Wow. Now... It's not that strange, actually. Um, I, I mean, it's different from what we might expect from having read The Lord of the Rings, but it's not totally um, unusual, right? In fact, it's exactly the kind of thing we see on many occasions in The Hobbit, right? Um Yes, I'm afraid trolls do act like that, even those that have only one head each, right? Remember that line? Uh there's there's a bunch of times in The Hobbit where the narrator's tone in particular um, invites us to laugh at things that are especially scary. And this is a really scary moment, right? We're seeing, I mean, even though we know it's not Frodo, we, it's still Hamilcar, right? I mean, it's still Frodo's friend has just been captured and dragged off by the Nazgul, and that's pretty scary. Um, and it's being diffused. Right. Yes, that is the. Uh, uh, this is the way to talk to dragons, James Oakley. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, the, con- the 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 conversation with Smaug is full of moments like this. Um, the troll scene, of course, in chapter two of the Hobbit is full of uh, of of moments like this. The Gullfimble gag. Yes, Jez. It's like that. Um, so, yeah, that to that's that's pretty interesting. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to me that he has, uh, uh, that he's using this tone. It's much more like the Hobbit. Now, remember way back at the beginning in phase one and, 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 and at the beginning of phase two, um, we saw how continuous this was with the Hobbit, right? Um, in tone and in the, the style of the narration. We're going to come back to this uh, because I think this is something that we, w- we can see some evidence of this kind of thing uh, at several points uh, in these chapters here. But, um, uh, but th- that, I think, to me, this is the... But it also suggests... Does it undermine the Black Riders to some extent? I mean, yeah, they are being undermined here, right? Um, we see them being mistaken, Um yeah. <laughs> yes, James uh, Lebeck, you're right. I was imitating the tone of the narrator in my poached ham subtitle uh, for this for this passage. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is Ham's description of what happened. Um, and yeah, uh, Eleanor, exactly. He did start out writing this like The Hobbit. We do. We do see that. Um, they got me, he paused and shuddered, but Gandalf came in the nick of time. Not quite the nick, said Gandalf, a notch or two behind, I am afraid. Two of the riders must have crept into Buckland secretly, while a third took the horses down the other side of the river inside the Shire. They stole the ferry boat from the Buckland shore on Thursday night, and got their horses over. I arrived too late, just as they reached the other side. Galarok had to swim the river. I had a hard chase, but I caught them ten miles beyond the bridge. I have one advantage. There is no horse in Mordor or in Rohan that is as swift as Galarok. When they heard his feet behind them, they were terrified. They thought I was somewhere else, far away. I was terrified, too, I may say. I thought it was Frodo they had got. Yes, said Hamilcar with a laugh. He did not know whether he was relieved or disgusted when he found out it was only poor old Ham Bolger. I was too crushed to mind at the time. He bowled that he bowled the rider that was carrying me clean over. But I feel rather hurt now. Now, now the banter between Ham Bolger and uh, and Gandalf is fairly standard, right? We see this kind of thing and it survives. You know, this that sort of banter survives. So again, we're going to come back to that too. Uh, you know a little bit later on. Um, but, uh, but yes, Spencer, or, or Jonathan, rather, um, yeah, the Nazgul is terrified. The, he's terrified, right? The Ringwraith is terrified of Gandalf. Um, that's really interesting. The relationship between, Ga- we, we've seen Gandalf chasing them away, right? Um, them dashing off in Buckland as the horns are breaking up. It's not the hobbits they're afraid of. They're afraid of the wizard with his sheaf of lightning uh, right behind him, 
right? Um, they run in fear of Gandalf. Uh, and that image, again, this is Ham Bolger's imagery, right? So, you know, uh, it's, um, it's, um, it's Ham Bolger's image. So, you know, I mean, he's being light about it, but still the image of, uh, him bowling the rider clean over, right? So what, he just knocked him down? Um, this is not this does not exactly sound like an epic confrontation, right, between Gandalf and the Ringwraith here, um, and um, yeah, and Emily, I don't even really know what that means. Emily's like, you know, how did he bowl him over? You know, did 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 Galarok the horse ram into him? Did you know, was the Ringwraith on foot at the time? I I have no idea. I'm not sure really how to picture that. Um, but yeah, it is fairly slapstick. Now again, right, this is Ham's description, and he might be hamming it up a little bit here. But um, still, it's 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 in, in, the combination of that and the and the terror of the Nazgul. Um, there are moments when they look really creepy, uh, and especially when they look particularly well informed. But on the whole, I would say between what the narrator did in that past scene and what we see, uh, you know, the the testimony of Ham Bolger here. Uh, the Nazgûr do not have as high a profile as they're going to get later on. And I don't just mean later on in the story, later on in Tolkien's conception. Um, they can't possibly match up to Gandalf, it seems. Um, yeah. Um, Jennifer says they're afraid of him now, but not when he was up in the tower. Well, they were. They left him up in the tower. I mean, they besieged the tower, but they didn't dare attack him. Um, they left him alone. So, I mean, he wasn't imprisoned. They never captured him. They didn't capture him and chuck him into the tower, right? Gandalf fled into the tower, and they trapped him there. Um, rem remember, there's only, what, two or three of them here? Um, but, um, yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, Yeah. Um, James Stevens says this would explain why they waited so long outside the house, right? Yeah, they needed the, they, they were waiting for the hour before dawn, presumably. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's keep going. Same deal here. This is the, this is the same conversation. The account of the siege on Weathertop, when Gandalf and, and, and Ham are on Weathertop. We found two riders already watching on Weathertop, he went on. Others soon gathered round, returning from the pursuit further east along the road. Ham and I passed a very bad night besieged on the top of Weathertop. But they dared not attack me in the daylight. In the morning we slipped away northwards into the wilds. Several pursued us. Two followed us right up the Horwell into the Entish lands. That, that is why they were not in full force when you arrived, and did not observe you at once. Okay, so there are no... Fires, because there's no fight on Weathertop at all. There's a siege. By night, they... Now, they have just gathered. Others have gathered. So there are at least, what, five at Weathertop? Um, around Gandalf here? And uh, five of them at night can prevent Gandalf leaving Weathertop, right? Um but in the daylight, they don't dare to attack him. So he can just leave and uh, go th get out of their ring, right? Escape their their siege. That Again, that too, pretty striking, right? Gandalf's, uh, Gandalf is clearly pretty far uh, above them. And then Jennifer, exactly, yes, they're, they're the ring wraiths. What do they do? Sit around and stare at the place where Gandalf is, right? Yeah, they... That that that's kind of what they do, right? They're not much into action other than hobbit napping, apparently, uh, ham poaching, right? That's pretty much that's pretty much all that they do. And yes, Brandon, uh, side note there, but an important one: Entish lands. Um, you can see throughout this, it's very clear that that Tolkien's use of the word Ent uh, means giant, right? That's very. Uh, it, it has nothing to do with trees, right? These are giants. Um, you know, the Entish lands is the land that he will later call the Ettenmoors, 
which is the same thing, right? Giant country. That's 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 what it translates. What both of those uh, translate to. And so yes, he's take because of course he's taken the word end uh, from the Anglo-Saxon. Um, you know the Aeotan uh, uh, Yewerk. Uh, you know the the work of giants. Um, so. Um, uh, so yeah, he, uh, Stephen asks, does he change it to Etten to con- avoid confusion with Ents after he creates them? Um, well, we'll, we'll keep an eye on that. I mean, we see he's already changed. It was the Dimril, it was the Dimril Dales, uh, at first, and now he's changed it to the Entish lands. Um, and we'll see him, uh, uh, we'll see him change that, uh, uh, uh again later on, um, but it, it that'll be interesting to see, Stephen. Let's keep an eye on that uh, as we go through. Um, but yeah, all the, so when he talks about Ents, when he talks about Giants, when he talks about Tree Men, Ents clearly, you know, the, the, the Ents as we think of them are clearly not, they clearly don't exist yet. They're clearly not there uh, at all in his imagination. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Brandon says there are Etten Moors in Narnia too. Yeah, giants. That's, that's giant country. Um, they both knew that word, <laughs> Etten, right? Uh, it's a Middle English word for giant, um, derived from the Ent in Anglo Saxon. Uh, yeah. Okay. Fine. All right. So, uh, last, uh, n- what I want to do next is kind of fun. So, you remember the long passage where Christopher Tolkien gives. The when you know that when he assigns letters to or reports the letters that Tolkien assigned to each of the uh, the ring wraiths and he gives all their motions. Now I don't know about you, I love that section because I love picturing what the ring wraiths are all doing and fitting it into the pieces of narrative that we actually get right, uh, which is really which is really fun. But I don't know about you, but I have a really hard time tracking with those paragraphs with like the the constant barrage of letters. Right. You know, it's like D, E, F go over here and then H, I do this and then D, E do this while G goes over there. Um, I find it really like my, 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 my own head kind of starts spinning by the time we get into the second paragraph there. So I'm trying an experiment. Um, let's try doing those same paragraphs, but let's replace the letters with names. OK, um, so I'm going to follow A, B, C, D, uh, E, F, G, H, I uh, through the nine uh, uh, writers that we get. If we actually assign them names, that'll help us to keep track of things. Right. So so you can tell me if this uh, if this helps. So I've replaced the letters with names. Six writers, Dumbo, Egbert, Fillmore, Gump, Humpty and Irv go ahead and invade the Shire. The vanguard rider, Dumbo, reaches Bag End on September 23rd night. Two, Dumbo and Egbert, then trail Frodo, etc., to the ferry. Okay, so already we can see, right? So, so um, the same, um, the same guy who talked, to, the same black rider who talked to Gaffer Gamgee, right, um, is one of the two that's trailing them to the ferry. Okay, uh, Fillmore, Gump, Humpty, and Irv, the other four that weren't that weren't uh, there, are on the main road. Dumbo and Egbert, foiled at the ferry, ride off to Brandywine Bridge and join Fillmore, Gump, Humpty, and Irv. So those other four are up there by the bridge, right? Okay. Humpty and Irv then ride along, scouring both sides of the road and reach Bree up and down Greenway on Tuesday, September 27th. Okay, so Humpty and Irv have headed off towards Bree, leaving Dumbo, (laughs) Dumbo, Egbert, Fillmore, and Gump back in the Shire, right? Okay. Uh, Let's see. Uh, on night cockcrow of September 26, 27, Dumbo, Egbert, and Fillmore attack Crick Hollow. There they carry off Ham. So it was just the, just the three of them there. Uh, so the three riders who show up at the house were the same two that trailed Frodo, Pippin, and Sam across the Shire. Well, he was Falco then and Odo for a long time. But anyway, you get the point. Uh, Frodo and Pippin and Sam. So the two riders... Plus the third who was up by the bridge, right? So plus Fillmore. Uh, they're the ones who t- carry off Ham while Gump was left to guard the bridge. Uh, Gump was left guarding the bridge, but now comes with them. See, they don't cross the bridge. They don't need to. They head out towards Bree. Humpty and Irv, remember, they're the ones who went on to, to Bree, uh, go through Bree asking for news to make sure Baggins has not escaped and got ahead. They get in touch with Bill Fernie. Okay, so they're the ones who come through and are asking questions and meet with Bill Fernie first. Okay. 
Let's keep going here. Dumbo, Egbert, Fillmore, and Gump, with poor Ham, remember they picked up Gump, who is uh, the rear guard at the bridge, uh, with poor Ham, now ride to, the, to Greenway. Does Harry see them? Probably not. At Amrath, which is south of Bree, right, uh, they meet King Aloysius and Biff and Clive on Wednesday the 28th, leaving for the moment the road deserted. So the king, uh, the witch king, or the wizard king, excuse me, he's still the wizard king, uh, the wizard king Aloysius has kept two riders with him. Right, so Biff and Clive haven't gone anywhere. They've just been hanging da- out down in Amrath. Uh, one wonders exactly why. Um, you know, maybe they were um, what there in case he needed messengers or something like that. Um, yeah. See now, Emily, that's a great point. Uh, Emily says that Gump didn't do a very good job guarding the bridge if Gandalf was right behind them. I think this is already in the version where Gandalf is delayed. So remember, like the the the. A sort of Crick Hollow take one in this in this set here. Crick Hollow take one was Gandalf gets there first, right? And uh, goes out the back door with Ham and then they the two of them together chase the riders away. Take two was they arrive just before Gandalf and they go off with Ham, but Gandalf is like, you know, 50 yards behind him, right? Take three is they get there, but Gandalf doesn't get there for several days, right? So he gets there and he finds the cloak and he's like, oh my gosh, they have Frodo. And this is that version, Emily. So Gandalf isn't right on their tail. <clears throat> but notice, they're not even suspicious that Gandalf is going to be right on their tail, right? Because they, 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 they pull back their rear guard. Gump doesn't stay at the bridge. They don't care, but they're done with the Shire now because they have, um, uh, they have Baggins, right? Or at least they think they do. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, no, Arthur, th- these aren't Christopher's names. I made these names up. <laughs> don't, 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 make, don't, don't make any mistake about that. Christopher Tolkien uh, very uh, uh, just used the letters, A, B, C, D. But again, I, I can't follow that. So I had to put in the names uh, to, to help me be able to parse this. Um, I find it helps. You can tell me if you think it helps. Okay, let's see. Uh, right, Biff and Clive, that's what we're talking about. The king is angry at this uh, because they left the road deserted. So notice, all four of them, Dumbo, Egbert, Fillmore, and Gump, the entire Shire contingent, have come back and they've, they've, they've hauled ham and they've come back. So uh, 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 the, the, the other two, um, well, yeah, Humpty and Irv, right, they went out through Bree and they've continued on. Nobody is there, Right. Because they've brought Ham down, they've left the road entirely unguarded. So the king is angry at this. He is suspicious of a plot, since Ham has not the ring. Dumbo and Egbert are sent back to Bree, arriving late on Thursday the 29th. Meanwhile, the hobbits have got to the inn. So Frodo, uh, uh, Mary, Pippin, and Sam leave Tom Bombadil and arrive at the inn just in that window of time in which the Nazgul have foolishly left the road unguarded, right? And the Witch King's, ma- or excuse me, Wizard King uh, is uh, is mad about this. Okay. Um, all right, Fillmore and Gump go back to the Shire. So he's, he sends back the rear guard, right? So Gump has to go back to the bridge, right? And he, and he has to bring Fillmore with him too this time, who, remember, he was at Crick Hollow as well. Dumbo and Egbert, the same two that followed Frodo across the, across the Shire from Bag End in Chapter 3, Dumbo and Egbert get in touch with Bill Fernie and hear the news at the end. So they're the ones who hear about the, uh, the incident at the Prancing Pony, right, with the disappearing hobbit. Struck out at once, they attack the inn but fail, and get the idea that Green has gone off. So, originally, they were going to attack the inn, the Nazgul. That is, those two, Dumbo and Egbert, were going to attack the inn to see if Green was still there. Uh, Do we see this as the two of them trying to make up for their mistake because they're the ones who took Ham and thought that he was the one, and now the, you know, King Aloysius is not so happy with this, right? Um... I don't know, but but he, he crosses this out, right? He crosses out the idea uh, that they fail, they attack the inn at once but fail. They fear Trotter, but get Bill Fernie and the Southerner to burgle the inn and try to get more news, especially of the ring. So they're afraid of Aragorn, so they won't go themselves. So they send they send their patsies, right? They send Bill Fernie and the Southerner in there. Um, yeah, James, that's kind of striking, isn't it? That they fear... Um, uh, they they definitely fear 
the um, Aragorn, a man, right? Uh, which is pretty, uh, which is pretty striking. Um, the burglary fails, but they drive off all the ponies. This is, of course, Bill Fernie and the Southerner. Fillmore and Gump, sent back to the Shire, bring news to the king that Gandalf has escaped and is in the Shire. Arguably, one of them might have stayed, right? But they've both left. Gandalf is in the Shire. And so we left our posts because somebody dangerous is there, right? Uh, which he reached on Wednesday the 28th, changed to Thursday, 29th night, and visited Bag End and the Gaffer. Notice, by the way, I am not spending a lot of time with the meticulous tracking of the dates and the timing of who arrives when, where, and everything. I'm interested in the movement of the wraiths here, but um, Christopher and, and, and Tolkien himself spent a lot of time ironing out those dates and calendars and things, and, uh, and I, 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 uh, I uh, leave you to their descriptions of those, which they, they do a really good job sorting that out. I don't think I could explain it any more clearly. Um, but... Um, uh, and it's not my central interest anyway. Okay. Dumbo and Egbert return to the king. So they've just come back from Bree, right, having sent Bill Fernie and the Southerner to burgle it, but it didn't pan out. Uh, Dumbo and Egbert return to the king and report. He is puzzled by Green and the Ring, by Baggins and Ham, and troubled by news of Gandalf behind. Things are not going well for the Ringwraiths, right? Uh, so the same two guys who tracked Frodo across the Shire uh, and captured Ham, uh, and now come back, and they're like, okay, so uh, Bill Fernie says that there was a hobbit in Bree, a party of hobbits out of the Shire, and one of them disappeared spontaneously in the middle of uh, of the common room of the Prancing Pony, right? This seems like a hot lead, but oh, by the way, they're gone. They, like, left, and apparently the Ringwraiths don't know how they, where they went or anything, right? And Trotter's with them, whom they're afraid of. Um, so Dumbo and Egbert have to be absolutely in the doghouse by this point. Um, James is wondering if he's going to bring Ham to Mordor and pretend it's Baggins, right? Who would know? Um, yeah. Uh, anyways, well, the king is going to decide, he decides to pursue Green with all his forces carrying Ham with him. Right, so he's going to keep Ham along. Gandalf goes to Crick Hollow late on Tuesday the 29th and finds it deserted. Old cloak of Frodo dropped. Gandalf is terrified lest Frodo is captive. Does he visit Tom? If so, make him arrive in the Shire on the 28th and visit Buckland on the 29th. If not, arrive in the Shire on the 29th, Buckland on the 30th. Either visiting Tom or not, Gandalf reaches Bree... Uh, reaches Bree on... Wait, where was I? I lost my place. Gandalf reaches Bree on Saturday, October 1st, after the hobbits have gone. He rides after them. The Black Riders, meanwhile, have left Amrath and revisited Bree to get news of Green and gone off along the road on both sides. So all of the riders have activated, right? You know, the king decides to pursue Green with all his forces, so he himself is heading up after them. All So two of them had gone past, right? Uh, uh, Humpty and Irv had already gone out, uh, out towards Weathertop, right? Um, so the other seven of them now are all moving up through Bree at this point. Um, uh, okay. Gone off along the road on both sides. Gandalf crashes into Dumbo and Egbert, who are carrying Ham, and rescues him. Boy, these guys, right? They really, um, they really can't uh, do anything right, clearly. Uh, he gallops to Weathertop, and reaching it and re- reaching it on October 3rd, he sees black riders gather and goes off north. Three riders, Dumbo, Egbert, and Fillmore, the same three that captured Ham the first time, are, sen- are sent to pursue him. You sort of wonder if, like, chasing after Gandalf is, uh, like, their punishment <laughs> for, like, having blown it so many times. I mean, D&E, Dumbo and Egbert, uh, they really... Um, they really have not uh, not done a good job at all. The rest patrol around and watch Weathertop, um, and uh, will be there. So those three are so six of them are going to be left, five or four or six of which are going to attack them uh, at Weathertop. So it's kind of wild right now. Of course, I gave them funny names in part because again I'm sort of following the lead of the narrator. Um, but also, I think it's um, 
Oh, green is Frodo, of course. Sorry, uh, 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 Stephen. Yeah, uh, Frodo is not going by the name of Underhill. His traveling name is Mr. Green still at this point. So yeah, that's uh, that's Frodo. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, this um, <laughs> the funny names to me seem to work. This is a kind of a comedy of errors on the part of the the ring rapes. They don't come off looking... Now, remember, this is not a narrative that was ever going to be told, right? You know, at no point is this part of the published story. Um, this is just Tolkien's own outline of what the Black Riders are up to. Um, but that outline does not cover them with glory, right? Um, they are fearful, incompetent, uh, and uh, making all kinds of mistakes all over the place. Um, it's, um, it's kind of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, Jennifer says, remember those cartoons where people chase each other in and out of ran- random doors down a long hallway? Uh, it's like that. Yeah, it is a little bit like that. Um, you know, the king himself seems kind of uh, intimidating, but, uh, you know, maybe he'd have been better served going himself in the first place. Right. Very Keystone Cops. A couple of you are uh, referring to the Keystone Cops. Yeah. Yeah. And again, so that's why I gave them the funny names, because it seemed to me to kind of fit actually better uh, than trying to give them uh, serious names. Uh, but uh, but uh, d- doesn't that help? Right. D- d- doesn't it? Uh, can't you? kind of wrap your brain around the the storyline there a lot better with names instead of letters. Uh, I could never keep track of those. Um, But, um, yeah, they seem a bit like the trolls in The Hobbit. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. Um, Okay. Well, let's shift to... Let's think a little bit more about the... uh, uh, about the the narrator here. We've been talking about the narrator some... Um, Look at this. Ham flies as shown overleaf, right? So Tolkien has written another passage on like a, the, a, a leaf somewhere and uh, not a physical, like a tree leaf, presumably. Um, and uh, he's, he's, he's alluding to that. Okay, uh, right. So the description of, of Ham Bolger running away um, scarcely differs from that in the Fellowship of the Ring, with Ham opening the door of the house, seeing a black shape in the garden, and fleeing out of the back door and over the fields. Apart, of course, from the fact that this is Hamilcar and not Fredegar, and apart from the notable words, afterwards lost, following. Ham Bulger had not been idle. Terror will drive even a Bulger to action. Okay, so we've talked about the three different versions of the Crick, the, the Crick Hollow story that he's been playing with here during this section, right? Started off with the with Gandalf coming there first and chasing them away. Second, with them capturing Ham and Gandalf right behind. Third, with them capturing Ham and Gandalf substantially behind, but eventually catching up with them. Now, the fourth version is, of course, the final version, the one where Gandalf is still far away, but they don't capture Ham, right? Whose name will later be changed to Fatty. He escapes out the back door, runs away. So, oh, so finally, in the fourth version, it's not Gandalf or Ham who uh, sounds the horn. Presumably it's the other Bucklanders uh, to whom um, Ham, who will later be fatty, uh, goes uh, for help. Um, but the thing that strikes me about this, so he's he's arrived at what is virtually the, uh, the completed text, uh, you know, the, 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 the final text. But there's that one sentence that he originally added that he later cuts out. Right, terror will drive even a bolger to action, and that's exactly that same kind of tone, right? Um, uh, and in this way, Hamilcar Bolger first crossed the Brandywine Bridge, right? Um, that same kind of I'm going to diffuse things with a funny remark, right? He cuts that, um, so he had that impulse originally, and later cuts it. Um, this seems to suggest the fact that he cuts that out seems to suggest an active purpose on his part to tone down that kind of remark from the narrator, right? Um, to, to, to decrease the active comedy, um, on the part of, uh, of the, um, of the narrator to make the narrator of the Lord of the Rings less like the narrator of the Hobbit, right? Um, Here's another example. 
This is the description of Frodo. <clears throat> uh, or no, this is after the description. Remember, the, the, the description of Frodo is more comical, right? About he's, uh, uh, he's a round-bellied fellow with red cheeks, and everybody laughs, right, at Gandalf's description because it makes Frodo sound really ridiculous. Um, the description of Frodo is much funnier uh, in this version than it is in the published version, right? So this is later on at the end of their conversation with uh, Trotter. If you want to know, said Frodo, I believed in you before Butterbur came in. I was not trying to trust you, but struggling not to trust you, to follow your own teaching. You have frightened me several times tonight, but never in the way that servants of the enemy would, or so I imagine. I think one of those would, would, well, seem fairer and feel fouler. You, well, it is the other way round with you. I look foul and feel fair, is it? laughed Trotter. We'll leave it at that, and say no more about round bellies. The way he alludes back to the fat joke, right, in Gandalf's description, right, um, this is more over-the-top joking. That Strider's brief sardonic chuckle, right, about, uh, you know, I, 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 I look foul and feel fair, right, that stays in the published text. And, and again, this kind of exchange is not unlike the kinds of things that the hobbits say to each other. But once again, we can see that there's a decrease, right? We see him going through and trimming down um, the co- the comic remarks, right? First, it was one made by the narrator. Now we see even among the characters themselves. And notice, to me, the most striking example of this. Right after Sam sings the troll song, Frodo's comment. At the end of the recital, Frodo says of Sam, first he was a conspirator, now he's a jester. He'll end up by becoming a wizard or a toad. Right? Of course, you remember, um, uh, you remember the original line, right? What is, or not, not the original line, the ultimate line, right? In the published text, what does is, what is, what is Frodo say? Or a warrior. Exactly. You end up by becoming a wizard or a warrior. But that's not the tone of the original line. In the original line here, it's just a setup for a joke at a dig at Sam about Gandalf's comment about turning him into a toad back in chapter two. Right. And I think this is specifically a crack about the conspiracy. This is this is Frodo still giving Sam a hard time for participating in the conspiracy, right? If Sam tells anybody, Gandalf will turn him into a toad, and then he discovers that he was part of this conspiracy, right? Um, and, of course, it, it flows from wizard, right? He'll become a wizard, or maybe he'll become a toad. Maybe a wizard will turn him into a toad instead of him turning into a wizard. Um, but I get, just think about the... The, the the quite remarkable about shift, right? From ending this line with a joke at Sam's expense, with him with him really ribbing Sam, to the completely serious, who will end up by becoming a wizard or a warrior, right? This foreshadowing of Sam's actual greatness, and of course, with the immediate uh, repetition of Sam's humility. Um, uh, Sam, of course, immediately going on to say that he don't want to be neither. Um, but anyway, so again, once again, we can see uh, ways in which Tolkien is actively making this change. So, you know, the, the, the shift in the tone of the narrator from The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings is very noticeable, right? Many, you know, obviously, you know, lots and lots of people have commented on that over the years. We were seeing at first uh, how the tone was totally consistent, how there was no shift. Um, we're seeing now... Uh, you know, we saw places where it was definitely shifted, right? He was no longer talking like the narrator of The Hobbit by the time he got to, say, Weathertop in Phase 2, right? Now we see him going back and actively shifting away from that, actively cutting that out. The choice to make the narrator of The Lord of the Rings not have the same approach, right? Not have the same uh, joking demeanor, Uh is uh, seems to be now something more like a policy. And here's another one. This one is a little bit more subtle, but also struck me as, as uh, indicative. Frodo made no answer. He looked at Trotter, grim and wild and rough clad. It was hard to know what to do, or to feel sure of his goodwill. He had been successful in one thing at any rate. 
He had made Frodo suspect everybody, even Mr. Butterbur, and all his warnings could so well apply to himself. Bill Fernie, Trotter, which was the most likely to betray them? What if Trotter led them into the wild, to some dark place far from help? Everything he had said was curiously double-edged. He had a dark look, and yet there was something in his face that was strangely attractive. Do you remember the published text of this passage? How is Tolkien going to change this? What change lies in store for this passage? You remember? There's little in substance that changes. Um, yes, James Lieback, you've got it. All of these sentiments are uttered, but they're uttered in conversation. That is, Frodo says them, Sam says them, often significantly reworded. Remember Sam saying, um, I don't see why we should let him lead us to some dark place far from help, as he puts it, right? Um, in other words, this whole passage, which is in the narrator's voice here, is taken away from the narrator and put into dialogue. And that strikes me as significant. It's decreasing the voice of the narrator because it's not just the comedic elements. It's not just the fact that the narrator of The Hobbit was funny. The thing that was that is to me even more important about the narrator, or more striking, I should say, about the narrator of The Hobbit is that he's dominant. Um, it's Again, it's not just the fact that he says funny things or makes contemporary references or things like that. It's that his voice is very strong. Um, the voice of the narrator is a, is a very... Uh, it, it's, it's a guiding force of the entire story. You are constantly aware of the fact that you are hearing from a person, right? You don't lose yourself, in a sense, in the story, right? You're, you're, you retain the awareness that you are listening to a story that is being told to you by somebody, right? That's the voice, the effect of the voice of the narrator. And that's, uh, that's great. Yes, exactly, Patricia. The narrator really is a separate, uh, uh, clearly distinct character, different from the, 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 the original author of the story, of course. Remember, uh, Tolkien, the narrator of The Hobbit, says he just compiled. You know, in the runes on the title page, it says that he merely compiled the story. The story is by Bilbo. He just compiled it. You know, he's, he's just the translator and editor. Um, but exactly, uh, James Liebach, it becomes showing, not telling. In the version, in other we're 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 gonna we're gonna take it away from the narrator. The narrator is gonna be less of a of a constant figure, and that's of course exactly what we're gonna see ultimately throughout the Lord of the Rings. We will get a narrator's voice, and sometimes the narrator gets some pretty good lines, but most of the time he's just doing description, right? Um, uh, he's certainly not as present a character. Uh, as present and clear a character as we get in The Hobbit. And so th that, that, that really struck me about this passage, that we can see uh, that sort of shift uh, starting to happen here. Um, yeah, yeah. Exactly, uh, James Oakley, because it's uh, 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 Strider's line, with Sam's p permission, we'll call that settled. I love that line, too. There's no need for it here, right? Because it's not Sam who says it. Um, okay. Here's another interesting moment. In the passage in the previous version describing Trotter's tales as they sat by the fire in the dell was changed, presumably at this time to its reduced form in The Fellowship of the Ring. That is the prose account of the Baron and Luthien story. And his story of Baron and Luthien now appears in the form that it has in The Fellowship of the Ring. The song itself is missing, but the final form was apparently achieved at this time since it is found written out roughly, but in finished composition among draft papers of this period. Uh, uh, you know, if you did the uh, uh, the Return of the Shadow uh, with me, you won't need me to remind you about how important I think that moment is when Trotter the Hobbit uh, first says, you know, I will tell you the story of Baron and Luthien. Um that's really the turning point of Tolkien's entire career, in my argument. Um, but um, but anyway, in this version, 
Oh, yeah, but hang on a second. You may remember, not only did he launch into the poem, um, but, you know, we were talking about like once the Silmarillion stuff finally came in, the floodgates just completely opened. Uh, we were looking, remember, at how he revised the poem. We looked at the, the version in the third phase text. Um, no, it was the second phase text, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the second phase text. We looked at the version in the second phase text compared to uh, the um, the original version, the Light as Leaf on Linden Tree, po- the, the version that he had published uh, uh, several years before. Um, and it was differ- it differed in the way of being more historical, right, of being more intimately connected with the whole Silmarillion story, right? And then after that, the prose version, remember that went on and on and on and on. He was like telling the entire story uh, of what happened after that. So uh, the, 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 you know, his first impulse, once he let those, that stuff in was to, to just, uh, to just keep on and on and on. We see him cut, cut that down. Was he planning to cut the poem? That would be under the circumstances kind of shocking, right? If first he opens the floodgates and then he's like, no, 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 I'm just going to cut the song. I don't know what to make of that, because on the one hand, it says that the uh, the song itself is missing, Christopher says, but he does say that he clearly revised the poem to its final form, to its published form, during the same time. Does that mean that he was just working on it on separate paper and was going to put it back in? Or does it mean that he had decided to cut it, but that doesn't stop him from continuing to revise it for its own sake, right? Which, of course, is a very Tolkien thing to do, especially with that poem that he loves so much. Um, so, uh, uh, so yeah. Uh, Bruce asks, do I think the Aragorn and Arwen relationship grew out of the fact that Trotter told the Baron and Luthien story? 100% I think that. Absolutely. Um, as uh, we've seen, there's no, there is no hint of Arwen anywhere yet. Um, Elrond has no daughter to date, um, so she doesn't even exist. Uh, but yeah, I think it's absolutely uh, to make the connection to the Baron and Luthien story that she is gonna exist. Um, yeah, exactly, Bruce. That's that. Uh, yeah, that's that's that was my experience too. Uh, Bruce says I had originally assumed Tolkien had Aragorn tell the Baron and Luthien story because of its significance to Aragorn's own life, but it turns out, yeah, it's actually the other way around, right? Aragorn's own life is determined by the significance of the Baron and Luthien story chronologically. You know, historically, that's how it happened. Um, it still works exactly the way Bruce that you and I originally read it, right? But uh, uh, but that's not how it came about in Tolkien's mind. Um, I don't think he had... Kate, I can't remember. Uh, Kate Neville is remembering a point where he had written insert poem here uh, and was trying to remember if that was this place or if that was uh, uh, if that was somewhere else, like in the alliterative tour and where, the, where Le- Leia's Leaf on Linden Tree was supposed to be originally. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> James Lebeck thinks it's... Uh, that Aragorn might have had a... Uh, a near escape. You know, it's a good thing he didn't choose to tell the Turin story instead of the Baron and Luthien story. Uh, just think how his career might have been different if he'd had. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's do a little poetry and then I'll come back to some prose. I'm going to do a restrained look at the troll song. You know how much I love the troll song. Um, uh, and Tolkien loved the troll song, so I feel totally justified in loving the troll song. But I there's there's one element of the troll song uh, in this first revision of the troll song. So Tolkien wrote the troll song ages ago. He wrote that by this time, almost 20 years before he's drafting this stuff, 19 years before uh, he dra- he's drafting. This. So the troll song is 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 an old favorite of his. He's already revised it. Uh, for Frodo, because as you may remember, this was when Frodo is in Bree and he needs a song to sing in the Prancing Pony. Tolkien's first thought is give him the troll song. Uh, and as you may recall, when troll, f- when troll, when Frodo falls off the table uh, and accidentally slips on the ring, um, it is at the point where he's giving the troll the boot. Right, so he's swinging his foot much too vigorously, imitating uh, the boot of the tro- the boot to the seat of the troll, and that's when he slips and falls off, and the ring goes on um, in the original first manuscript. But he quickly shifts from that and decides to do the Man in the Moon song, 
Uh, so he's already revised the troll song, but he revises it again, actually three more times, four more times uh, before it finally gets to the published version. This is the first of those uh, subsequent revisions here. Uh, and it's to me the most, with no, it's definitely the most interesting. It is unique among every version of the, uh, of the troll song. Um, so Tony, the original version has all the Christian references, the references to the churchyard and to the Oriole, to the halo, uh, and to wearing black on a Sunday and things like that. Yeah. Those are in the original, uh, root of the boot poem that he wrote back in 1920. Um, the thing that he did for Frodo's version of the song in the prancing pony was to take out the Christian. Re- that's the number one thing that he did was take out all the Christian references. Um, but then he revises it again, and much more significantly, these are the final three stanzas of the um, of the new troll song. So this is the first version, the first draft given to Sam uh, in the in the troll shows. Uh, tell me what's different and what's interesting about that. But just as he thought his dinner was caught, he found his hands had hold of naught. But he but he caught a kick. But he caught a kick, both hard and quick, for John had slipped behind him. Mind him, blind him. He caught a kick, both hard and quick, for John had slipped behind him. The troll tumbled down, and he cracked his crown. But John went hobbling back to town, for that stony seat was too hard for feet, and boot and toe were broken. Token spoken, the stony seat was too hard for feet, and boot and toe were broken. There the troll lies no more to rise, with his nose to earth and his seat to the skies. But under the stone is a bare old bone that was stole by a troll from its owner. Donor, boner, under the stone lies a broken bone that was stole by a troll from its owner. Yeah, the troll dies, right? How crazy is that? And and remember, I, I think we can see evidence even in these stanzas here that this has been given to Sam, right? Notice it has Sam's dialect. Uh, uh, Frodo singing this song would not rhyme troll and stole in that way. That was stole by a troll from its owner, right? That's Sam right there. That, that's, that's not a Frodo line. Um, so... Yeah, <laughs> Stephen says nobody lives happily ever after, right? Yeah, exactly. That's 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 kind of what we see there. Um, uh, <laughs> with his seat in the air, James. That's classic, isn't that classic? Right uh, there, the troll lies no more to rise with his nose to the earth and his seat to the skies. I love that line, right? Uh, I mean, this is this is this is hysterical. So John manages to kill the troll. With this boot, his foot is still broken, right? Now, notice we don't get the. Uh, remember uh, in uh, in the in the final version, right? Tom, his name is changed back to Tom. Tom's leg is game since home he came, and his bootless foot is lasting lame. Those are the first two lines of that last stanza, right? Instead of emphasizing the la- the permanent lameness of Tom's foot, instead we get uh, the troll's mortality, right? Uh, there the troll lies, no more to rise, with his and, not, and with his nose to the earth and his seat to the skies. It's not just the fact that he's dead; uh, he's comically dead, right? You know, he, there he is permanently with his with his seat sticking up in the air. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Arthur thinks that uh, is very, uh, very uh, uh, socially conscious of Uncle Jim uh, to be a bone toner. Uh, that is, I agree, very very thoughtful of him. Um, and yeah, Bruce, the shift from Tom and uh, uh, Tim, uh, Tom the protagonist and Tim the uncle, right, to, uh, uh, to John the protagonist and Jim uh, the uncle, uh, lasts for a while but th- through three versions of this, but then reverts back to Tom and Tim uh, in the final published version. I don't know why. I don't get that. I'm not really sure. Um, but... Uh, uh, Anyway, yeah. So, okay. Um, I don't know what to make of this. I mean, I'm tempted to read into this because it's Sam, right? That Sam's imagination. Because uh, remember, Sam is 
meant to have made this poem up, right? This is this is out of Sam's head. Um, so is it just that you know that it's supposed to be significant that when Sam writes the song, he writes a triumphant troll slaying song? I mean, loving Sam as I do, I'm tempted to uh, try to make a lot out of that, right? But um, I, uh, but. I don't know how much we can say if we make out of it, but it is certainly a striking version of the uh, of the song. But it's not. Um, we do get Christopher didn't print the later revision, so we can see how uh, Tolkien changes it prior to the final published version. Um, but we do have access to that. The third version, the the so this is the first version, Sam's first version. There's the third version of Sam's. We don't we don't have I don't know we have the second version anywhere, but we do have the third version and then of course we have the final the fourth, the final published version. Um have you guys heard it? Let's listen to it. Standing up is behind his back as if he was at school he began to sing an old tune. The troll sat alone on his seat of stone and munched and mumbled a bare old bone. For many a year he'd gnawed it near for me, it was hard to come by, some by, dumb by. In a cave of the hills he dwelt alone, and me it was hard to come by. Up came John with his big boots on, as he could throw and play what is yarn. But it looks like the shin of an Uncle Jim, I should be a loin in graveyard, caveyard, paveyard. This many a year has Jim been gone. And I thought he was lying in graveyard. You're supposed to join in. My so. lad said, troll this bone I stole. But what be bones that lie in a hole? Thy uncle was dead as a lump of lead. Therefore I found his carcass. Harky, marky. He can spare a bone for a poor old troll. He's got no use for his carcass. Said John, I don't see what the likes of thee. With an axe in leaves, go make him free. With a leg of the shin of my father's skin, so hand the old boat over, rover, trover. Rover. Though dead he be, belongs to he, so hand the old boat over. For a couple of pins, as a troll and grins, I'll eat thee too and gnaw thy shins. A bit of fresh meat will go down sweet, there'll be a nice change in the uncle. Sunk of the uncle, I'm tired of gnawing old bones and skins. There'll be a nice change in the uncle. But just as he thought his dinner was caught, he found his hands had hold of naught. Before he could mind, John slipped behind and gave him the boot to land him, warn him, darn him. A bump of the boot in the seat, John thought, would be the way to learn him. But harder than stone is a flesh and bone of a troll that sits in the hills alone. As well, set your boot to the mountain's root, for the seat of a troll don't feel it, dear it, feel it. Old troll laughed, but John did groan, for his poor toes did feel it. John's leg is game since home he came, and his boots, his foot, is lasting lame. But troll don't care, and he's still there, with a bony bone to its owner, donor, boner. Troll don't see it is still the same. The bony bone for its owner. All right. Um, notice that, of course, already it's shifted back to the original ending, right? You know, Troll's old seat is still the same already again by the time we get to the third version and before we get to the published version. But you'll n- notice how he modulated. Uh, James Lebeck, you're right. His tempo changes are really wonderful, right? And uh, did you notice how he the, the 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 one that he emphasized most the place where he changes the tempo most drastically is the one where he's shifted back where the troll is not it was you know uh the uh, but harder than stone is the flesh and bone of the troll that sits in the hills alone right that, those were the lines where he slowed it down most um it became most state like that's the that's the turning point that's sort of like the joke of the whole ending of the of the song, right? Um, which is what makes it so striking to me that he had originally changed that uh, and decided to to uh, 
not make the, you know, to make the troll actually uh, killed. Um, uh, yeah. So anyway, there are other interesting differences. I, I, you know, the fact that the uh, the reference to the carcass is still there, but of course you can hear how much closer it is to the final published version uh, than even even not counting the end there than we can see uh, in the early. So we're almost there. But notice it's still John and Jim too in that third version. So he he still hasn't changed it back uh, to Tom and Tim. But um, yeah, see, Emily says, hearing him sing it, I understand better why he loved the song so much. Yeah, Emily, I have to say, like, certainly my relationship with that song was changed forever when I first heard him sing it, mostly because I didn't know the tune, so I had never gotten it. I had been trying to parse that verse for years uh, and figure out how on earth you were supposed to read that thing. Uh, and it wasn't until I heard him singing it and got the tune and, of course, heard the spirit in which he was singing it that it all made so much more sense uh, than it did uh, before. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, as Josiah points out, John and Jim are much more unabashedly out of place linguistically, uh, while Tom and Tim uh, could easily have alliterative hobbitish origins. Um, right, exactly, as uh, Josiah points out, like Sam uh, being from Samwise, right? Not from Samuel, uh, because that name would be, uh, uh, would be out of place. Um, but, you can, but you can get there, right? And we see other people. Uh, if you look at the Hobbit um, um, genealogies, you can see other, other similar uh, kind of things. Uh, Tom uh, doesn't usually, uh, is not short for Thomas, right? Um, uh, but uh, like Tolman, right, is, uh, is, is the Tolman Cotton, right, who's called Tom. Um, anyway, okay. Um, all right. Let's keep going. Enough poetry for now. We'll come back to poetry. Though I might not get to it tonight. But anyway, you got, we, we got several other things to talk about. Let's talk about wizards. We remember the big Gandalf problem, right? And we talked about this a little bit last week. The fact that one of the biggest problems he had with Gandalf was Gandalf figuring, not only figuring out Gandalf's movements, but the tone and rationale of them. There's a sense in which Gandalf started this story way behind the eight ball, right? You know, in the first, when, when the story became serious and less of a joke, right? When the Black Riders came in. Gandalf didn't get the memo forever. Gandalf was still in a Hobbit sequel for several chapters after uh, uh, Bingo, as he was then, was already in a fairly serious story and meeting Trotter. Um, so the way in which Tolkien handles um, uh, uh, Gandalf is is really interesting. We talked last time about the changes of his movements. Um, look at his new letter. Uh, this is uh, this is his in the fourth phase draft. Um, here's Gandalf's letter when he leaves the letter with Butterbur, not when Trotter delivers it. The Prancing Pony Bree, Tuesday, September 12th. Dear F, I am starting back tomorrow and should reach you in a day or two, but things have become very dangerous and I may not get through in time. He has found the Shire. The borders are watched and so am I. If I fail to come, I hope that will be sufficient warning to you, and you will have sense to leave the Shire at once. If so, there is just a chance you will get through as far as Bree. Look out for horsemen in black. They are your worst enemies save one. They are ringwraiths. Do not use it again, not for any reason at all. Do not move in the dark. Try and find Trotter, the ranger. He will be looking out for you, a lean, dark, weather-beaten fellow, but one of my greatest friends. He knows our business. He will see you through if anyone can. Make for Rivendell as fast as possible. I hope we may meet again. There I hope we may meet again. If not, Elrond will advise you. Yours, and then he signs his name, still in, uh, in, in, in Anglo-Saxon runes. Then we get the P.S., which I'm skipping, because we're going to talk about that later on. Uh, that's, of course, the verse. Uh, PPS. It would be worse than useless to try and go beyond Bree on your own. If Trotter does not turn up, you must try and get Butterbur to hide you somewhere and hope that I shall come. PPPS. I hope B does not forget this. If he remembers to give it to you, tell him I am very grateful and still more surprised. <laughs> Farewell wherever you fare. Okay. Um, uh, 
<laughs> yeah, Brandon Minnick is saying, seriously, Dumbo and uh, and uh, Egbert aren't his worst enemies? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, exactly, B is Butterbur. That's right. Okay. What do you notice? What do you notice? About, so remember, this is still in the story, uh, in the part of the story, or the version of the story, when Gandalf hears about, he goes away from the Shire because he's heard about the Ringwraiths, right? Goes to find out, learns that they're here, right? Um, remember, Trotter sends him a message in the Shire. So he's at Bag End. He gets a message from Trotter saying, dude, Ringwraiths. And he's like, dang, gotta go check that out. So he goes down to check that out, and now he's on the run, right? Because the Ringwraiths are not afraid of him now. But anyway, he's on the run, and he's afraid that he's not going to get through. So he leaves the letter with Butterbur just for Butterbur to give to Frodo after Frodo gets there so that he has Gandalf's instructions and explanations. You know, it's almost like when Gandalf is writing this, Gandalf is writing a, like, if you are reading this, I am probably dead kind of letter, right? It's not explicitly what he says. You know, he says we'll probably meet up again at Rivendell, but but it's that sort of letter. Um, hopefully you won't need any instructions from me, but in case we don't connect, here's what you should do. Um, and he seems to... Um, uh, he, he, he seems to to doubt that uh, Butterbur is going to remember to send it. But if he doesn't, it's not a huge deal, right? Tell him I'm very grateful and still more surprised. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's joking about that. Uh, Kate says that Gandalf doesn't seem to realize how scared the Black Riders are of him. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Emily points out that even though Gandalf is really concerned, he still finds time to make a crack at Butterbur's expense. Though, Emily, he still does that in the published text, right? Thing wanted, always buried. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that that's actually not going to change. That That's still going to be characteristically Gandalf. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> Sorry, I was confused for a second, Arthur. Uh, in Arthur's comment, apparently uh, uh, autocorrect cha- changed Butterbur to Butternut, and, and I was really, I was really confused there for a moment, Arthur. Um, but uh, but yeah, that that the the business about Butterbur hiding them is really striking too. You know, uh, especially ironic as I was pointing to in my subtitle here, right? Um, the thing that Gandalf kept saying back in the old days, right back in the second phase, Gandalf kept saying, push along, right? Push right along. Don't, don't, don't dally, right? Don't, don't stay drinking there at the prancing pony, push along. Right. And now Gandalf is saying, don't, don't go stay hide, right? I will come for you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, And Brandon, it is interesting that he considers that Trotter may not be there. But note, he's taught. This is still the version of the story when he's going to end up besieged in the Western Tower, right? So he knows he's in danger. Clearly, he thinks that Trotter is in danger too. So he realizes there's a chance that neither one of them uh, are going to make it through. Neither one of them are going to be able to catch up with Bilbo. Um, so. That is interesting. I mean, so you know that, that whole atmosphere. It makes me wonder: has he has he changed? This is also around the time when the Black Riders are very well informed, right? When they tell uh, Butterbur about uh, Frodo Baggins being the one that they're after. Um, it makes me wonder: did he briefly have the Black Riders increase in stature, essentially, and then had them decrease? over time, right, when he was revising that, because that, that business, when he's, when the narrator is making fun of them, when they leave with, with, uh, Hamilcar out of Crick Hollow, um, that, that's a much later version, uh, of the, you know, than this one is. So, you know, maybe, maybe he, uh, was actively toning them down over time. I'm not, uh, I'm not really sure. Now we finally get the story. The Wizard Saramond the White, written above at the same time Saramond the Grey, 
or Grey Saruman, sends out a message that there is important news. Trotter hears that Black Riders are out and moving towards the Shire, for which they are, for which they are asking. He sends word to Gandalf, who leaves Hobbiton at the end of June. He goes S.E., leaving Trotter to keep an eye on the Shire borders towards Rohan, or Horserland. Not a big fan of Horserland. Gandalf knows that nine Black Riders, and especially their king, are too much for him alone. He wants the help of Saramund. So he goes to him where he lived on the borders of Rohan at Angrabel, or Irongarth. Saramund betrays him, having fallen and gone over to Sauron. Either he tells Gandalf false news of the Black Riders, and they pursue him to the top of a mountain. There he is left standing alone with a guard, wolves, orcs, etc. all about, while they ride off with mocking laugh. Or else he is handed over to a giant fangorn, Treebeard, who imprisons him. Okay. Um... This is the first concept, right? Lots of observations we can make from this, right? Um, we get we get Rohan, right? We, now we saw Rohan a bit at the end of uh, of the Return of the Shadow, so that was good. Um, we get that again. We get uh, Isengard, right? You know, we get Iron Garth here for the first time. Um, we get Saruman. We see that from the very beginning, the essence of Sauron's character concept is that he is a wizard who is supposed to be Gandalf's ally, but who has already fallen and go, gone over to Sauron, right? Um, uh, so, and yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Yana, we had talked about this before, but yeah, giant Fangorn, clearly the giant named Fangorn. Fangorn, Treebeard, is still a giant, um, not a tree dude. He's still a tree man. Uh, a giant, in other words. Right. Um, and his jailer, that's, uh, that's been a, a common possibility. Um, exactly, Emily. The one thing that all these stories have in common, Gandalf is guaranteed to be captured in a, in a, at high altitude, right? Whether it's the Western Tower or whether it's on top of a mountain or whether the giant tree beard is going to keep him, uh, there's uh, there's there's altitude involved uh, all the way through. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, Saramond. One thing that really strikes me is very interesting here. Um, The colors, right? Saramond the White is what he's uh, first called, right? Um, but then he's changed to Saramond the Grey, or Grey Saruman, right? That's really interesting to me. There's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, I've, I've said before, you know, a lot of times when people talk about wizard colors and ask me about wizard colors. Um, I've often said it's kind of tempting. A lot of people, when they read this, basically read the colors as if there's a really simple color system like, um, uh, you know, belt colors in karate, right? Um, you know, if you train long enough, you, you become the gray, and then, you know, you can take your, you can take your test and get promoted to the white. Um, that's that's kind of how people will sort of think of it or talk about it. Um, uh, Kate, Radagast doesn't have a color. He's not mentioned by color. Just my cousin Radagast is how Gandalf speaks of him in The Hobbit when he's spoken of. Um, yes, James, the only association of white with wizards was uh, that uh, there were a bunch of white wizards, which seemed to mean merely good guys. Not like who used white magic, not black magic. Um, there's it's that the reference, you know, is the meeting of the white wizards that Gandalf went to, like other good guys, they totally weren't morally sketchy, right? Um, and uh, and yeah, uh, Tony, he's not called Gandalf, isn't called Gandalf the Grey, not uh, 
has he been called that? I'm trying to remember now in the earlier drafts. Has he been called Gandalf the Grey yet in the drafts? I don't remember. Um, but whether or not he has, the fact that Tolkien is basically, you know, should he be the white? Should he be the gray? Right? It seems to me pretty clear that there's not that, the, the colors, it seems unlikely that that's really connected to some kind of ranking system in uh, Tolkien's mind at this point. Um, as for the significance of his name, this I find very interesting. With the brackets, remember, this is not three different alternatives we're being given at the beginning. This is two different alternatives and then the second one. So the text reads, The wizard Saramund the White or Grey Saruman. But it's changed immediately, right? So he's changed it to, The wizard Saramund the Grey or Grey Saruman. The second is a translation of the first one. Saramund the Grey or Grey Saruman. Um, and... So, so I do not think the issue here is that Saramond was the original version and later on he's going to revise the name slightly to Saruman. Uh, that's not the case. We see Saruman is already here. And that's not surprising because Saruman is an Anglo-Saxon word. Um, uh, Saruman or Searuman, there's an E in there, um, is a, a wise man, a crafty man, somebody who's good at making things, a clever man who's good at, at uh, making things. If you are Searu, that means you're, you're cunning, wise, uh, in that older sense of wisdom. Um, craftsman, basically, yes, yes. Uh, the cunning mind, that's what uh, Saruman means, uh, a cunning person. Um, so when he says Orgre Saruman here, he's translating Saramond into Anglo-Saxon. Um, he's not calling him Saruman uh, uh, consistently because I don't think he's, there's no evidence that he's yet attached Anglo-Saxon to Rohan, right? Which is why Saruman is called that all the time later on. But we'll see. Right? Wise guy, Karita, exactly. That's precisely uh, what his name translates to. Um, uh, yeah, so anyway, um, so the, the concept is there. So I don't, again, I don't think this is a question of like the evolution of Saruman's name so much as that he was originally going to make him go by this other version, uh, Saramond, um, but also be called Saruman as well. Um, notice one of the things that I find most puzzling about this passage, about this concept, is that um, in none of these possibilities is Saruman himself the jailer. That never seems to occur to him, right? Um, he just, uh, he takes him, he betrays him, but he doesn't even capture him. Saruman betrays him he tells Gandalf false news of the Black Rose, so he lies to him, and they pursue him to the top of a mountain. So he betrays Gandalf to the Ringwraiths, and the Ringwraiths corner him. Saruman himself doesn't keep him, which again makes me wonder, is Saruman meant to be a superior of Gandalf? I don't see any evidence of that. Um, there doesn't seem to be any you know, but you have come, Gandalf, and here you shall stay, right? He's, he's not come under the power of Saruman here. Um, he's just betrayed by him to the Nazgul, who are the ones who tree him. Um, he's outsourcing Gandalf's incarceration. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, uh, yeah, Kate wonders if uh, Angrabel or Iron Garth doesn't have a tower yet. Yeah, it's a great question, right? Iron Garth, right? Um... You remember that a garth, uh, you remember, I don't know if you ever knew, a garth is a walled garden, right? That's what a garth is. So iron garth could just refer, so there, there are walls involved, right, in whatever Angrobel is, but it's, uh, there, there isn't any, as Kate says, there's no clear reference to a tower. Um, so yeah, maybe he had insufficient altitude to keep Gandalf, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um.
Yeah, Brandon Minnick is wondering, like, what came first? Saruman being the white, and then the head of the council, and so therefore the white being the thing that the head of the council wears? Uh, or is it or is it the other way around, right? Was he, did he, was he first the head of the council, and then that's what made white significant? Or was he first white, and then that's what, like, oh no, let's make him the head of the council? Um, you know, how did that come about? Again, I don't see much evidence that he's the head of the council yet. Um, that he's really the head of anything. He's just the traitor, right? Um, and clearly seems a, 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 a peer. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, I, I do suspect, Josiah, that um, uh, Angrobel is related to the Gobel word from Cinderin, which means town rather than fortress, right? Like Tavrobel, right? Um, same, uh, same, uh, Peace there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And Ross Goble, yeah, good, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, it, it doesn't seem that there's any reason for him to, or any means for him to keep him there. All right. Now we get the intervention of the Eagles. Gandalf is captured by Saramund, changed to Saruman. Uh, elves send word that he is missing, which reaches Rivendell Saturday the 8th, October 8th. Gandalf is still imprisoned. Here I am going to pay attention to the dates. Gandalf is still in prison on Saturday, October 8th in this version. Saturday, October 8th. Remember where Frodo is at this point? Where is Frodo on October 8th? Remember? Where was Frodo on October 5th? Exactly, James Liebeck. He's, and Kate, yeah, he's he's wandering between, he's between Weathertop and Rivendell. Remember, October 3rd is when Gandalf is besieged on Weathertop in those versions of the story. Um, he's, um, uh, he's, so they get there, Frodo and, uh, Trotter get there on the 5th of October. Three days later, so three days after the attack, uh, at Weathertop, Gandalf is still in prison. Um, and it's only then that, uh, word reaches Rivendell that Gandalf is missing. At which point, Gorfindel is sent out and messengers are sent to the eager the eagles. The eagles learn about it on October 11th, and they fly all around and bring Gandalf uh, to Rivendell on the 19th. So he barely beats Frodo to Rivendell. Right? Um, this is pretty striking, right? October 6th is the attack on Weathertop. James, I think that's because it's after, like it's in the next day, because it's at night. Um, probably in the dark before dawn, right? Um, uh, yes, Yana, he does have his dream. So when Frodo first has his dream of Gandalf up in a tower, Gandalf is up in a tower. It's a current events dream, which is the kind of a dream that's pretty common in these stories. Um, yeah, exactly. Now, remember, this is late. Uh, all of them, you'll recall the charts of Gandalf's movements and stuff, none of which involved him still being captured in a tower uh, on Saturday the 15th of October, right? Um, but um, but this is this is a later revision than those earlier those earlier things. This is this is an, this is the, another one of those new plots, right? So the the Saruman plot is a new plot. Uh, so here we have Tolkien contemplating chucking out all of those timelines that he made, pretty much the entire chronological sequence uh, with the ring wraiths and Gandalf and everybody. We're going to chuck out that whole thing and have Gandalf stay in prison uh, until om almost until Frodo reaches Rivendell. When Tolkien shifts Trotter away from being a hobbit with wooden shoes and into... Um, uh, into being um, Aragorn, descendant of uh, Numenor. He goes whole hog, right? Uh, this is the end of Gandalf's 
letter. You'll recall this is, uh, you know, uh, Trotter has a letter to certify his uh, his identity, his identity. Right. Gandalf gives letters both to Butterbur and to Aragorn. Um, so Aragorn has this corroborating evidence on his person. Uh, this is to certify that the bearer is Aragorn, son of Celegorn, of the line of Isildur Elendil's son, known in Bri as Trotter, enemy of the Nine, and friend of Gandalf. Frodo stared at the words in amazement. Of the line of Elendil, he said, looking with awe at Trotter. Then it belongs to you as much as to me or more. It does not belong to either of us, said Trotter, but you are to keep it for a while, for so it is ordained. Why didn't you show this to us sooner? It would have saved time and prevented me and Sam from behaving absurdly. Um, Bruce asked, does the sword that was broken exist yet in Tolkien's mythos? Yes. Yes, there is definitely a broken sword around, um, as evidenced by the verses, which we'll get to soon. Um, it's... It's... Um... It's remarkable to me, again, again, having decided to make him a Numenorian, right? Uh, he trumpets that at the very beginning. I mean, that Gandalf's letter would be like, and by the way, he's he's uh, the uh, the heir of Isildur, son of Elendil, right? Um, I mean, that's kind of it's kind of a big deal. Now, Aragorn is carrying this letter himself, right? So it's not like Gandalf is leaving this information out somewhere. Uh, but still, this is a pretty big deal. And yeah, his dad. Right. Um, wasn't Aramir was his father in the first, you know, when we're looking at his uh, experimenting with what to do with Trotter there in the fourth phase. Um, now he's the son of, uh, of Kelegorn. And remember Christopher Tolkien's note. This is not just like the name of the son of Feanor who tries to kill Baron and Luthien and usurp Snargathron, right? This is not just similar to the name of Kelegorm. This is the same name as the son of Feanor, because as Christopher reminds us in his notes, which I certainly would have forgotten, um, Tolkien changed Kelegorm's name to Kelegorn when he was writing the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion. Um, so Kelegorn is the contemporaneous name of the son of, of that son of Feanor. Um, so it's not just like that. It is that same name. Now, of course, it's it's not the same person, right? Uh, but I can't explain that. I don't understand at all the impetus that leads Tolkien to connect Aragorn to Kelegorm um, by having his father named after Kelegorm. Um, I mean... It doesn't necessarily have to reflect on him as a person. I mean, it's not Aragorn's dad's fault that he was named after a total jerk. But why make that connection? I mean, it's not like Tolkien was forced to make that connection, right? Why make that connection? Uh, of all connections, why that one? I don't know. I don't get... Is it because he's a hunter, right? Kelgorm is a great hunter. And so, you know, Aragorn is a ranger, and this is sort of supposed to connect with the fact that he's... Uh, he's, you know, J James Oakley is wondering if Aragorn is going to re repudiate the deeds of his father. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, uh, Brian, I agree. It's going to remain a thing that Gondorian kings and stewards are going to borrow first age names. Absolutely. We're getting, we're even going to get a Turin bar, right? Uh, but, um, uh, I don't think... Uh, Josiah asks a very sensible question. Is this like how Fingolfin was almost a goblin? Um, the goblin king whose head gets lopped off by Bandabras Took in, in The Hobbit um, was uh, was named Fingolfin uh, in the first draft of The Hobbit before publication in the first edition. It was changed to Golfimble, but still. Is this another one of those examples? But Josiah, I can't think so. Uh, and the reason I can't think so is that this is after the floodgates have opened between Tolkien's mythology and his current story. Um, and by making him the heir of Elendil, he is connecting Aragorn explicitly with those old stories. You know, even before he is going to be singing the story of Barad and Luthien, right? He's already connected by lineage to those old stories. 
So it's not like, hey, let's recycle a random name and maybe no one will ever notice. Um, no, it's noticeable because it's those same stories that he's connected to. So, um, again, the only guess I have um, is... Oh, so Emily, you were asking exactly the same thing about Fingolfin. That's really cool. Um The only ex the, the only thing I got is that Kelligorm was a mighty hunter, right? So is it just that like they thought this was a cool name? They the Rangers, right? They the the line of Elendil thought that this was a cool name for like a Dunedin chieftain who is a great hunter and ranger, right? And so he was named Kelligorm. Um, I don't know. I mean. You're right, Jonathan. No, nobody's read those stories yet. Like, it's not like the readers are going to be rearing back in horror at that stage, right? If he if he names him Kelligorm, I'm just asking why did Tolkien do that, right? Uh, because Tolkien sure knew what that name meant, right? Um, and he had just been writing that. I mean, remember the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion is what he was in the middle of when he stopped and sat down to write The Unexpected Party and started The Lord of the Rings. And at that point, the point in that story where he stopped, right, uh, was in the Turin Turin Bar story. You know, and so he's just been doing that. Um, I don't know. Um, he'd just done Baron and Luthien and expanded the whole Kelgorm is a jerk who tries to kill Baron and Luthien element of that story. I, um, it seems a little tone deaf, of the rangers. But maybe that was the point. Maybe that's what Tolkien is saying, that, you know, they're not um, their own reading of the stories is, I don't know what, less scrupulous. I mean, we see evidence of that, right? I mean, the number of stewards that get named after Turin, right, is, uh, is, is kind of evidence of that, I think, to some extent. Um, I mean, doesn't it seem like a, a fair question to ask? Like, what what mom in their right mind, what Gondorian mom in their right mind would look at their baby and be like, let's name him Turambar, Master of Fate, right? Because I think that's a, that's a, you know, it's a snappy name that I, I'm sure will work out well. There's clearly some tone deafness, I think, there. Um, so maybe that same impulse to show the Dunedain being a little tone deaf in the naming there is, uh, um, uh, is, is what, uh, Tolkien is already thinking and suggesting here. Brandon and Brian were just asking the same question. Does it suggest that they don't really know the old stories? Um, uh, perhaps, perhaps that is indeed what it suggests. Uh, that's possible. That's possible. Um, Either they don't know them or they're kind of selective in what they care about from them. Well, and I'm not really sure which. Um, but um, anyway, okay. So next we're going to do poetry. I want to look at Aragorn's verses, but I can't. Um, because I want to look at all five versions of Aragorn's verses, and we don't have time for that. It's already almost midnight, and I'm going over time even counting how late I was in starting class tonight. So um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, and we're going to, we'll start with that next time. So we'll start with Aragorn's verses next time and then continue on. But don't worry, it's not like we're getting behind because we're totally not. I'm so right on schedule here uh, this time through. Uh, it's pretty awesome. So, um, uh, so next time we'll swiftly go through the five versions of Aragorn's poem and then we will continue because we've got more poetry to talk about next time. Next time we are doing one chapter, Bilbo's Song in Rivendell. Um, so it's time to get our errantry on next time. But we have extra time because I w there's no class next week. I'm going to be away next week. Uh, unreliable internet. Uh, so no class next week. But I'll be back the week after that. So two weeks from now, you have two weeks from now uh, to read as much errantry as you can possibly uh, handle. Um, the evolution of that poem, how we get from uh, there was a merry uh, there was a merry messenger, a passenger, a mariner, um, uh, getting from there to um, 
uh, to Arendel was a mariner who tarried in Arvernian um, is amazing. And I love this story. Uh, so we're totally going to uh, gonna spend some time on that. All right. Um, so see you guys in two weeks. And thanks for joining me. And uh, I can't wait to talk about more poetry with you guys next time. So see you in two weeks. Bye now.